Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 7 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay or Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Joining us right now with the worst job on Wall Street, Stephanie Roth with his chief economist at Wolf Research. Uh, you're, well, I got to do the flash first. Excuse me. I it's forgot. in Lisa's contract. E- it is. I and know. I, we, you know, we covered equities, but we didn't do bonds and currencies with a better day to check than I could do with our interactive brokers. Bloomberg Business Flash, El Mateo. You got it. And we've got futures mix. NASDAQ futures actually leading the gains right now up about three tenths of percent. 68 points, a big part of that. Tesla shares are up about six percent. Sources say President like Donald Trump's team looking to push the development of fully self-driving vehicles. That's the reason for that. Now we go to Dow futures. Little change down about 41 points. We have S&P futures little changed up about four. We have the two-year yield at 4.29%. That's little change. The yield on the 10-year 4.46%, and that's up about one basis point. Um, to currencies, the Bloomberg dollar spot index right now down about a tenth of a percent. Uh, we have the Japanese yen weaker, euro, British pound stronger. We have Bitcoin up about seven tenths of a percent at around 89,000, recovering from that biggest two-day retreat since the U.S. vote. Uh, shares of NVIDIA falling down. Down 2%. That's following that report over its Blackwell chips. It's led to concerns about delays. And finally, another company making news. That would be Spirit Airlines filed for bankruptcy in New York, listing assets and liabilities between $1 billion and $10 billion. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Lisa, thanks so much. The VIX 16.57. Stephanie Roth with us with Wolf. Steph, I was all excited because you're in the process now of putting together your year-ahead view at Wolf Research to be published December-ish, maybe before or after around the jobs report of December 6th, I believe it is. Is it, how do you do that knowing the uncertainty of our politics, knowing the uncertainty of our economy? Do you rewrite it in January? One important thing to think about is a lot of what the policies that Trump might put in place are gonna be relative, uh, important for 2026. So 2025, in a way, it's gonna be about animal spirits and it's gonna be about Immigration to some extent, but that's going to be the bulk of what we see for 2025, which for us is actually a decent economy. On immigration, you know, it, it, it's probably not going to have as big an impact as many think from an inflation perspective because the, the labor market's now back in better balance. So we don't necessarily need the influx of people the way we did two years ago. Now, when we're talking about 2026, then it becomes all about tariffs and the uncertainty that creates, but that, this is probably not a 2025 story. How about the deficit? Is that a, it seems like a story that's, every year so and you know i've been seeing some numbers we were just talking uh to someone uh, earlier was talking about you know they can increase the the deficit by trillions of dollars um are you con- how concerned are you if at all about that sure trump has thrown out 11 trillion dollars worth of tax cuts is he going to get that all done no so we're looking for a you know yes a, a, a tax cut that could be a couple trillion dollars mm-hmm. something like a, a net of Three, okay. um, but that's not that different from what Harris was proposing. So okay. the market, the bond market, should be okay with that. And and by the way, we're looking for something that's going to extend mm. TCJA. And then beyond that, we're we're forecasting about five hundred billion dollars of additional net tax increases, which is t- tax uh, cuts, which is really not that impactful. I, I mentioned December. I think it's six. Is, is the jobs report? Do you look at the negative statistic with revisions last time? Is truly hurricane induced? Or is there more going on right now in the labor economy? It's prob- it's very likely hurricane induced. And we're going to learn a lot more about that in state when we get state employment tomorrow at 10 a.m. That's well, one of the most important. Listen Whoa, stop yeah. the show. Take <laughs> notes. State employment? <laughs> what? On my screen. So this is, this is going to be the most important data point from an economic perspective this week. What are you doing tomorrow at 10 a.m.? Sweeney and <laughs> yeah. Alex want to know. <laughs> state unemployment. So what do we learn from that kind of data? So we're going to get it. This helped us in a big way look at Texas after barrel because oh, we got okay. a sense of the the extent of the hurricane impact on the data and then we could assume we get that back the next month and this is going to be the same thing we're going to look at Florida most importantly to see <clears throat> to what extent did Florida drag down the overall payrolls and if it was significant then we know we should be able to add that back okay so this is state reports what do they go into that we normally report so what they're going it's it's, B, it's BLS it's it's just telling you basically what happened from a state perspective from employment 30 in the last days month. ago in yeah, the last month in the last month 
So from the last payroll reading, we, we, we got that 12 number, which was terrible. So you're going to look at North Carolina. Exactly. And we're we're going to look at the Carolinas. Georgia. We're going to look at Florida, Georgia. And if we, if we see a notable decline, then we can know that that's probably hurricane related. And the next month, you'll get payback in a positive way. How's the consumer out there from your perspective? We had some retail sales recently. Um, how do you think about that? So the retail sales print was was very funky. So it, it was it was negative on core. But then when you dig into it, you had pretty big revisions for the, the month yep. prior. So when we when we take a three month average, you're looking at a 0.29 percent month on month, which is annualized about three and a half percent. Not great, but not terrible. Mm -hmm. And we have to kind of look at it into perspective. It's prob probably you didn't have an incredibly strong September and an incredibly weak October. You probably have to think of some sort of average between the two. And it was likely related to a, a, a stronger, um, a, a, a better weather forecast or better yep, sort of yep. unseasonably strong weather in terms of September. That boosted the print. And one reason why we got the, ne the significant positive revisions in September, you also had an early back to school season. So the combination of these things lifted September and dragged October because you got a bit of a payback from that. What's your real GDP and nominal GDP call 12 months forward? 12 months forward. We're looking for something like 2.5% real really? GDP. Solid. So, solid GDP and something inflation that's 2.2. 4-ish. Two, yeah, 2.4-ish. So something almost 5% in terms of nominal. That's so solid. how do they react to that at the Fed? I mean, that's, that's solid. It's right? solid. It's complicated for the Fed, right? Because they don't want to forecast agreed. any of, of the fiscal stuff. Um, so they're going to probably want to cut a couple more times. They told us that. What they really should be doing is saying, we're, we're, we want to cut to something like 4%, and then we're going to see where the economy is. Because that, that, that's, the, that's the, the message that we're getting from them. They say they're data dependent, but they continue to want to cut, even though the data has been stronger and inflation a little bit stickier. <clears throat> so quickly here, do you suggest that the December meeting December 18 and then over into the next meeting I can't believe I'm saying 2025 I'm such a fossil <laughs> January 29 those two meetings give them still a lot of wiggle room to cut I think they have wiggle room to cut at one of the next two probably not at two. both and that's as close as I get to Fed chat. That's good. I do okay. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah, they'll, they'll probably want to cut it at one of the two, and then cut at some sort of quarterly okay. cadence until the middle part of next year. This is like talking to Henrietta Trace. Yeah. I didn't know anything about the state report tomorrow. No. Did you? No. No, I barely do the. Report. Lisa, did you keep it from us? Yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> she will have Stephanie, you're brilliant. Well. Stephanie Roth, a huge value add there from Wolf Research. You're listening to the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. Last time she was with us, we got a huge response. I think it's the mathiness. Yeah, maths is how they say it. Maths, that's yes. how they say it. I they don't do know why maths. they do that, but... I don't, I don't like know why it. they do that. It's difference equations, first order yep. difference equations. Amanda Rabello uh, joins us now. She's with DWS. And before we get to all this fancy mumbo jumbo and the quintuple leveraged artificial intelligence, big data ETF, are you kidding me? Just what are your thoughts on the magnitude of the money in the Bitcoin ETFs? I mean, if I, I, if I talk to somebody at BlackRock, I get a song and dance. Mm -hmm. What do you think at DWS of this moment? I think it's really interesting. We have launched digital assets, um, ETCs, in our European <coughs> platform. Um, we definitely think that there is a place for them. But I think that one thing that's important, not just with Bitcoin, but with all exposures that can be wrapped in an ETF, do you understand the underlying, right? Um, and I so I think that at the end of the day, this is an access vehicle. Uh, okay, but Oxford Mathematics. <laughs> we just came back from the Boston Fed. Mm. We had the number one payments guy in America, uh -huh. Emeritus Illinois. Illinois, Professor Khan say mm -hmm. Bitcoin is basically the new Beanie Babies. Do you know what a Beanie <laughs> Baby is? <laughs> I do. Okay, okay, okay. That's the where's the underlying in Bitcoin? Yep. Or is it a Beanie Baby, as Professor Khan says? I think um, I completely understand what Professor Khan is saying. We always think about you know, in your CFA textbook, you're always thinking about valuation of an asset. But how do we value Bitcoin, right? So I think um, you know, at the end of the day, there is some degree of speculation, which is driving a lot of the volumes at the end of the day probably more, more rather than less. So that's definitely something that I think all investors need to be aware of. On the technology front, where at DWS are you seeing the flows? Is it still 
AI? It is still AI. So we've launched a number of different um, technology-focused ETFs. So we have cybersecurity, semiconductors. We also have US national critical technologies. But XAIX is the one that we're seeing flows going in on a daily basis on our US X side. XAIX yeah. is the ticker. We also have a European version as well. It's the largest artificial intelligence ETF in the world as of last Friday. Cybersecurity, Lisa, here's the, here's the ticker for you for the cybersecurity ETF. PSWD password. How cool is that? <laughs> How cool is that? So cybersecurity, in addition to AI, before there was AI, I always yeah. told my kids, cybersecurity, that's like yeah. the new plastics. It's going to be, they're going to be spending money on cybersecurity forever. Right. Yeah. So is that, <clears throat> what are you seeing in that? side of the tech trade? Cybersecurity, we've seen um, it become much more important. I think beforehand, a lot of people were thinking about it in the earlier days of um, cybersecurity, um, you know, as a theme, that it was more of a consumer kind <coughs> of uh, topic. But I think, you know, with the Russia-Ukraine war, a lot of people have now right. seen that cybersecurity is really a defense topic much more than it has been in the past. Um, we also know about, you know, hackers in different geographies. Um, you know, this is their attempt at warfare, basically. Um, it's easier to build or quicker to build than, you know, building an army or a navy. Um, also different spends which are required as well. So I think everyone is understanding now that cybersecurity right. is important in a different dimension than just your McAfee or your, um, you know, having a personal VPN. Amanda Rabello with his expert on ETFs. We have Belchunas today as well. Yeah. It's just too much. I know. I, I got, <laughs> it is I got too goosebumps. Much. DWS Group here. I had a white paper 30 years ago that tried to model out not 20 to 1 hedge fund blow it up leverage, but where nonlinearly from 1 to 1 out to a little bit of leverage, out to a little bit more leverage, do you run into problems? Here's Fidelity's propaganda. For professional investors, leverage ETFs are useful in statistical arbitrage, short-term technical strategies, et cetera. Most people are buying them just to goose the return. Mm -hmm. Where's the tip point for you on where leverage is a really tough game to win at? Yeah, the thing about the leveraged ETFs is that it's not, uh, you know, two times on a long-term basis or three times on a long-term basis. People need to understand this is a volatility resetting um, strategy, be it an ETF, an ETN, in structured products. So I think when we start to see volatility increasing quite significantly, we're not at the highs of the market, but we are kind of teetering upwards. Um, then you start to see that the payoff doesn't work in the way that a lot of the investors Do have Do you have a ratio it. where that payoff doesn't work as a two to one, three to one? The quintuple DWS <laughs> <laughs> X tracker tech fund? Um, we do not. And we've decided, um, we've made a conscious decision to not be in the levered space here in the U.S. I know. I yeah. offer the triple leverage to <laughs> cash flow. Why is that? I mean, it seems to be popular products. It would be, but I think that, you know, there are some fantastic, um, you know, competitor peers that we have in the market, like, who, who already own that space. Okay. So we don't need to be there. All right. The Fed's cutting interest rates, even though the bond yields are going higher. I don't know how that all works. Um, what do you guys do from the ETF front to take advantage of a Federal Reserve that appears to be on a pretty significant path of rate cutting? Yeah. Um, so I think that, you know, for the past uh, couple of years or year and a bit, um, cash has yielded enough and it's, you know, effectively risk free that um, rotating into cash could have made sense. Um, all of us, you know, when we think about um, income requirements within portfolios, you know, now five became the new norm a little bit. And so we need to think about how we're still going to generate that five. So we like international dividends a lot. HDEF is our international high HDEF. dividend strategy. Cool. Um, we're known very much for international equities more broadly, just as a Frankfurt headquartered um, entity. But then um, that one has like kind of around a 5% um, yield uh, on average. Then we also think that international real estate can make sense as well. So houses, the ticker, and REITs, we -A -A always know. Right? Yes, okay. HAUZ, exactly. And then um, we usually feel that um, REITs, you know, are income generators, same as infrastructure um, securities as well. So if you want to think about these as well as a way to generate kind of four, five percent yield, that that makes sense. On the fixed income side, um, we really like high yield at the moment. Actually, really? there's more of a quality component than there has been historically. So um, default rates um, have pretty much 
much halved in the last uh, 18 months, so much stronger, much more stable than historically. But then also you can now slice and dice high yield mm -hmm. much more than you could do before. So thinking about the higher qu um, credit ratings within high yield, things like BHYB, which is our um, double B, single B X financials. Also thinking about HY down, which is our low beta high yield product, which is kind of better than a fallen angels product because you're looking at the market already pricing in better credit quality with yield rather than waiting for the credit rating agencies to then make that call. Fascinating stuff. I mean, Torsten Slock from Apollo was out with mm -hmm. a note this weekend saying, hey, interest rates are higher for longer here. Um, so the top of the inv high yield space is probably okay, but the lower end yeah. probably at risk when he was calling out interest coverage and all those types of things. Exactly. Are you seeing that in your, are your investors, do they want to take that lower end risk or no? Um, they're not brave enough yet. And right. it's great to hear from Torsten, one of our, our former dear colleagues. Um, you know, we think that um, really segmenting high yield is making sense. That kind of crossover space is where you need to be. But I think that um, in certain sectors, there's still uncertainty in terms of possibility of repaying uh, debt. So um, mm. stay away from that for now. Amanda, thank you. Amanda Rabello with us, head of X Tracker Sales, DWS Group. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. Listen live each weekday starting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Henrietta Trace, she's with Veda Partners, and I'm lucky that she joins us right now and informs us about the great debate. Henrietta, I see different threads here, but can the new Senate Majority Leader excuse me, yes, the Senate uh, Majority Leader Thune of the Dakotas, the present leader McConnell of the Kentuckys, <laughs> or whoever, can they delay, distress, distract the march President-elect Trump wants with his appointees? They can. I think that there is a real <laughs> undercurrent of focus on both the House and Senate side around President-elect Trump's seriousness about some of the nominees that he has announced so far. And so there is this sort of wariness that the president-elect might do things that have not been done before in American history, such as sort of tell the House and Senate to go on recess so that he can nominate his can appointees. Can he do that? that? There is a clause in the Constitution that allows the president-elect to do that. Um, I think it would be extraordinarily explosive. And I think what right. I would um, state to <clears throat> clients is, is basically, the autonomy that senators feel, the seniority they feel as having six-year terms versus four-year terms is a very real thing. You don't want to get between them and their um, right. incredible sense of importance in D.C. To Republicans, and particularly Republicans in name only with that six-year tenure, coming in, do they look at the president-elect as lame duck? No, I don't think so. Um, I think especially because there's going to be so many freshman senators, not just the turnover from the election, but all the senators that I expect the president-elect to tap to go into the administration, there could be as many as nine freshman senators. And it's worth bearing in mind that over 75% of the House has only ever had Donald Trump as their Republican president. So there is this um, very real deference. Certainly it's held so far, it's only been two weeks, of course, but this very real deference. Um, and I'd add on just one more layer here that the president is so much more popular than the down ballot Republicans. In some of these states, there were as many as 47,000 Republican voters who went in and pulled the lever for Trump and then left the ballot box. They did not vote Republican down the ticket. So a lot of those Republican members from specific swing states need to be deferential to Trump because that's what their voters want them to be. So in effect, uh, Henrietta, is there in fact a Senate opportunity to challenge some of these uh, Trump appointees, or are they de facto, like the Matt Gates of the world, are, are they going to happen? No, I don't think they're going to happen. I think that the Senate is going to see itself as a uh, temper of some of Trump's more aggressive instincts. So, for example, there's a very real effort right now from the Senate Republicans to see the ethics report on Matt Gates, which has allegations of drug use or sexual abuse, things like that. They want to know exactly what the ethics committee found. And so while we might not see that released into the public, um, they do want to see it internally as senators, and they are going to pull rank to try to get access to that. I guess the next pick of note, particularly for Global Wall Street, is the Treasury uh, Secretary. And there's, I guess, some, a little bit of confusion there about where the 
camp or the Trump administration, the Trump camp, what they'd like to see. What do you think is going to happen there? Um, well, I think Scott Besson has been the leader for the last couple months. I think that's probably still the case, although I do know that the Trump transition team has been trying to audition additional CEOs from Wall Street, from you know corporate America, to try to get somebody with staff that they can sort of plug and play right into the agency themselves. That component of wanting to have a lot of staff to bring with them is a really big deal. Um, I'm really more interested in Bob Lighthizer and where he mm-hmm. might go. I don't expect that to be a Treasury pick. But I do think that he'll be sort of a roving czar, which is something that we've seen the um, Trump transition team already um, attach onto as a good policy idea or governing idea. Um, so seeing where Bob Lighthizer land, I think is probably the most important thing, particularly because he's so competent and whatever yeah. he wants done on the tariff front is, I think, what we're going to see. Henry, to, to get back to the recess issue, which I, I'm, I'm assuming this is like immediate. It's like mm. the now can one scenario be the Senate says we're not going to recess, but then the House votes to recess and that gives a president elect a window to put Thune in his place? Do I have that right? Yeah, I think that's roughly correct. I mean, we've, as I said, we've never seen this done before. But if there's a disagreement between the House and the Senate, the president has the authority to step in and say, y'all can't play nicely together. I'm going to disband you for a period of time. And so long as it's more than 10 days, then he can start nominating recess appointments. And those people will be in uh, for a specific period of time, probably like two years before the next uh, turnover um, when the next Congress starts. But um, that that's the dynamic that they would try. The disruption associated with that, I mean, 10 days is a really long time for your first 100 days agenda to just disband the House and Senate. That means, you know, first and foremost, we're going to have the debt ceiling that's due January 1 in terms of the suspension expiring. So that clock is going to be ticking. We'll have other cabinet official appointments that they'll want to confirm. Um, and then obviously the tax bill that you need to get to writing. We will not be able yeah. to do a budget, which is due the first Monday in February. Um, there's there's a lot of stuff to be done. And 10 days is a very long time. And Paul, I saw that there's like 4,000 positions to fill. In wow. 800 okay. or yep. 1,000 or yep. 1,200 of them involve the president. Yep. working with the legislative branch. It's not like 42 people. Right, that's exactly, that's you know. the U.S. government. So Henrietta, between now and Inauguration Day, what are some of the key things you're looking for, the mileposts that you're looking at that we should be focused on? Um, I am watching the Senate Finance Committee. What we're expecting there is for Mike Crapo, the incoming chair of the Senate Finance Committee, and who I expect will be the Budget Committee Chair, Lindsey Graham, they need to huddle and get together to figure out what the scope of the tax bill is going to be and therefore what the magnitude of deficit increases need to be. And those two gentlemen need to work together. Those committees have to work together because in order for the tax bill to pass late next year, you have to have the budget first. So they effectively need to know the parameters of the tax bill right now. Um, and so that is the process that is underway. There are going to be working groups formed to break out you know, energy tax policy, international tax right. policy, et cetera. And then they'll get with Lindsey Graham and say, this is the appetite of deficit increase that we need. Can you get this through your committee? And we should know that information before January 20th. The the goal is to get some paper out to members by December. Well, bring a senator from South Carolina back. Uh, You probably had no idea. 21 years he's been in the Senate. Senator Graham, Mm -hmm. is he going to provide, is he going to be deferential to the executive branch? Or is he going to be, you know, is is President Trump says Republicans in name only? Is Senator Graham going to join other senators and say, no, you're not doing this to us? I don't think so. And indeed, the Senate Budget Committee has gotten less obstructionist, less rhino in the last couple of weeks since the election even than it was before. Mitt Romney, for example, is no longer going to be on the committee. Chuck yeah. Grassley is not going to be on the committee. Um, and I think you're probably going to see some of the freshman senators who just won their races rise up to those ranks. So the deferential part, or the part where you would stand up to the president in this realm exists with deficit increases. Um, I'd say the most proprietary piece of information in my brain right. is the understanding I have of what can get 51 votes from the Senate Republican Conference. I believe it will be the biggest reconciliation bill that we have ever passed in America, um, somewhere in the range of two to two and a half trillion dollars worth of deficit appetite. So in terms of that old school hey, Republicans are concerned about fiscal spending. That's not going to be the case next year. There's going to be massive deficit increases, and we will know that number from Lindsey Graham with the Budget Committee votes, which is a very big deal. 
Paul, can we agree we learn more from Henry and Trace in seven minutes than all the weekend blather <laughs> exactly. combined? Wow. Henrietta, that was a clinic for, uh, with Veda Partners. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. Listen live each weekday starting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal. Joining us now from Rio, from the Copacabana Beach, and he's not hes not at the Copacabana Palace. He's at some boutique thing with a balcony sure. and, you know, well, that's all, I mean, you know, it's the way he rolls. Yep. David Gura joins us it's right now thing. from the G20 meetings. David, I have the recollection of a G20 meeting in Pittsburgh. You didn't cover that because there wasn't a beach. <laughs> there was a Pittsburgh G20 meeting with President Obama years ago that had substance. Will this G20 frolic have substance? Well, there's plenty on the agenda, Tom. A lot of talk about climate and development financing and things that you'd find at any number of, of G20 summits in the past. Uh, but the real action at this one is on the sidelines where these one-on-one -on -one meetings are happening among uh, world leaders. And uh, of course, President Biden is here on the heels of his trip to Peru for the APEC summit. Uh, he's on this kind of swan song trip through South America, taking stock of what he's accomplished so far, but also reckoning with the fact, as you know, right. uh, that his days are numbered as, as president. He's got fewer than two months left, uh, and he's trying to offer some assurance to those other world leaders as they kind of look to each other and wonder about what the future is going to bring. In the photo op, are they going to line President Biden up under you for United States next to Vietnam, or does he get does he stand in the front row as President Trump would assist? Well, you're hitting on something really crucial here. Uh, we make fun of these photo ops, but so much goes into them about who's standing where and who's next to whom. Um, at this one, there's an element of awkwardness because the G20 includes not just U.S. allies, uh, but adversaries as well. Uh, the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, isn't here. Sergei Lavrov, his foreign minister, is. And the way that they're getting around any awkwardness about President Biden's placement vis-a-vis -vis Mr. Lavrov or any others is they're going to do this photo op at kind of a broader development conversation that's going to take place earlier so they're not going to have like a, a standard 20 leaders next to each other. It's going to be a, a, a wider group of people who are invited to that photograph. So something different yeah. about this, this summit as well. Paul, I've stood 20 feet, not even 20, 15 feet mm -hmm. from the IMF photo op. And you think it, it's like your high school photo. That's right. The, why do the football players have to, you know, come forward? It's exactly. <laughs> hey, David, <clears throat> to what extent, if any, does President-elect Trump loom over this G20? Huge. I mean, I don't know that everyone's talking about him in specific, but everybody's wondering what's going to happen. You know, Tom brings up that summit that took place in Pittsburgh at the tail end of President Obama's tenure in the White House. You know, when when he was leaving and Donald Trump was coming in, there was a lot of uncertainty, a lot of questions among world leaders about what the next four years would hold. They didn't know how Donald Trump was going to lead or what his relationship was going to be like with other countries or these multilateral institutions. Something else that's different about this summit is people know what Donald Trump is like and how he governs. And so I was kind of counseled going into this summit by Ben Rhodes, who is an advisor to, to President Obama. Don't look at how they're thinking about their relationship with Donald Trump. They largely have that figured out, and it may be you know, a variation on a theme slightly different than it was back in 2016. What's more interesting and more important is to look at their relationship to China. And so walking around here in Rio and Brazil, you see the influence that Brazil has on this country, on Latin America broadly, the inroads that China has made. We're seeing just a real shift in the winds here, and I think that you see that kind of in stark relief as the summit gets underway, Paul. Just the role that China's playing, the number of mm. meetings that President Xi is expected to have with other world leaders, and how few relative to that President Biden's going to have. Interesting. So what is the extent there of the interaction between, uh, on the sidelines there, we're seeing some reporting between uh, Xi and uh, President Biden here? So they had a meeting over the weekend in Peru at that APEC summit, and it was a moment for uh, them to talk for two hours. They hadn't spoken since April, and that was a telephone conversation. So uh, widely agreed this is the last time they're going to talk while Joe Biden is in, the, is in the White House. And again, it was a moment for President Biden to uh, acknowledge the fact that the relationship is markedly better than the one that he inherited. They do talk with some frequency, even if it's not regularly. The lines of communication are open between Washington and, and, and Beijing. Uh, but you know, I, I mentioned President Xi being here. 
you have a lot of new faces who are just trying to introduce themselves to other folks. Keir Starmer's here, and that was the first meeting on his mm. agenda this morning was with President Xi, and that in itself <coughs> is revelatory. You haven't had a prime minister sitting down with the Chinese premier uh, since 2018 when Theresa May did it. So a reset of that relationship on that side as well. Uh, David, Rio report, please. Were you at the Bottega Savada last night, neighborhood bar seat six, or did you hold court at the Belmont Copacabana Palace? Look, I've, I've walked by the palace. I'm angling to get a caipirinha there a little later today, but I will say there the food go. has been extremely good. The seafood, very fresh. There was octopus on the menu last night. I availed myself of that. Oh, uh, and no. I mentioned that the caipirinhas, the cachaça, the, 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 the cane liquor involved in those. Right. Extremely smooth, and I enjoyed uh, a beverage or two of my choice last night. Tom. I'm on an island off Mexico a million years ago, and they're playing Fleetwood Mac. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> That's un-American. Did they play Barry Manilow's Copacabana uh, in Rio? Tell me they don't. I've heard some Joel Gilberto, but not, not uh, Barry Manilow yet. I will lend an ear to it tonight. As you can see behind me, the famous Copacabana Beach. Um, music is playing constantly throughout the day. I've wandered uh, a little bit around, hope to get oh. into the water. The sun rises at 5 a.m. here, which is such a relief. I'm hoping to take wow. a, a, a pre-surveillance dip tomorrow, Tom, and I'll report <laughs> back on that. There we go. David Guerrero with team coverage from Coca Copacabana Beach Radio. For those, uh, Rio, for those of you on radio, not seeing Rio, it is, it, what, a, what a view. I yeah. mean, it makes I mean, nice he's got a France phenomenal look shot. Like I mean, you know, but I mean, he hasn't <clears> seen a ray of light, sunlight in his lifetime, I don't think. The guy's got... No color, I guess he's, I, he's just sunblock. He's like a Washington nerd. He is. I mean, he's a know. Washington nerd. He's, you know. He'll probably get in a water. He can, you know. Brooklyn. He'll, he'll, you know. You know. Maybe he'll take the tram up to the Rock and. Yeah. All that. I'd Lisa, love, I've have never been, been to there. Rio. I'd love to go. I have not, but I've always wanted to. I, I've yeah. always yes. wanted to go. I was, I was scheduled once or twice to go, and you know. Surveillance you road know. trip. Yes. I, I, it's <laughs> a long ways away. It I is. Mean, it's, yeah, that's okay. It's, it's like south. Yeah. And it's it's not. Eighty two degrees. And sunny there today. Wow. I just kind of Googled yeah. it. So they're good. David. Well, they're, they're, they're under the equator, tell me, right? Yeah. I'm, this is how ignorant I am. Well, they're going into their summer, I think. Yeah, they're yeah. in the, yeah, okay. The whole southern. Team coverage, David Gurr <laughs> there. We're on uh, top of it. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live each weekday, 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.